who's logged on or is in the process of logging on into this free webinar, which is being hosted by the PCC's office and <coughs> is being supported by our one minute. Are we, we are going to be hosting today's event. Uh, we've got a, a smashing lineup of speakers for you, which I'll go through in a minute and kind of set the scene of what we're going to hopefully cover. Um, Karen? Sorry, a bit quick then, I'm going to take myself off mute in time. Yeah, so um, yeah, Karen Evans, Chair of Domestic Abuse Forum for North East Hampshire, got a real interest so in uh, people that are, perhaps find more barriers to accessing support, you know, who might be hidden within communities and feel that the support there is not for them, and then perhaps further victimised if they're uh, victims of hate crime. So really interested um, in this topic a lot of work with the police laglows, lesbian gay liaison officers looking at actually how um, we can reach out into the LGBT plus community, build up confidence in the police in reporting, accessing support services but alongside that obviously very interested in BAME groups, uh, diverse groups, people with disabilities, anybody really who might find it hard to actually access that support. Thanks, Karen. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin uh, this webinar, just, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, if you need to go to the toilet, please do. You don't need to put your hand up. Um, but more seriously, uh, we are actually recording this webinar, so we're hoping to use it several times, particularly for colleagues who are unable to be with us today. If you do not wish to be recorded, uh, please just go onto a blank screen or just let myself, or uh, just you can just direct message me and let me know. Um, we, we uh, can I kindly ask people to put their microphones on mute? Uh, you'll be surprising how much background knowledge, I'm sorry, background sound can be caught up in, in, in the video recording. And also, if there are any questions, can I please ask that they are left to the end of each speaker's session? Right. If everybody's happy, I'm going to begin. So this, this webinar is about um, helping our business community within Hampshire and the Isle of Wight to get a better understanding of hate crime and its importance and why we need them to play a role. Um, I'm hoping within the next hour, hour and a half, we will be able to share with yourselves a better understanding of what hate crime is, how it can manifest itself in the workplace, hear about the importance of recording and the role of community intelligence, know what support there is, not only for you as an employer, but also if you have employees or colleagues who are suffering from hate crime, Learn what best practice already exists and is available to you to harness and to kind of borrow with pride. We, we've, we've decided to put this webinar on now, uh, particularly as the country and particularly businesses begin to ease the restrictions and go back to some level of normality following COVID. Um, crime is one of these crimes that, that affects anybody and, and it doesn't matter who you are. Um, in terms of our speakers today, we have uh, a couple of speakers. I'll just introduce them now. So we have uh, Natasha Wright uh, from Enterprise Cars, uh, one of our partners whom we work with uh, for the last 18 months to develop a guide on hate crime, specifically aimed at business communities, which I will refer to, or Natasha will refer to within her section. We are very, um, we're a very warm, uh, uh, warm uh, greetings to our colleagues from the constabulary, particularly Sergeant Eric Wong from Southampton and colleagues uh, Armin Sasso and uh, Will Bergstrom, who are community, commu community cohesion officers. And we're hoping to have later on uh, a colleague from the voluntary sector, uh, a guy called Sa Sam Waddington, who is a, uh, who's gonna talk about third party reporting centers and what communities can do to help themselves in terms of increasing reporting uh, within uh, hate crime. So the most basic thing for me to start off with is what is a hate crime? So legally, the definition that we use is any non-crime incident which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice based on a personal characteristic, specifically race, religion or faith, sexual orientation, disability and transgender. So they're the five characteristics that are currently recorded by the police service. And I'd just like to stress an important point here. If a victim or a third party thinks it is a hate crime, 
irrespective of whether there is evidence to corrobor corroborate that or the police are able to investigate it or not, it is still recorded by the police service as a hate crime. And, th and that's really important because it gives the victim confidence that the services, particularly the police service, believes in them. But it also supports the police in terms of providing vital community intelligence. Now, hate crime can manifest itself in several ways. There's, a, there's, a, there's the there's this typical things that you may expect, the kind of physical abuse where people are beaten up because of maybe their sexual orientation or, or the color of their skin. There can be threats, there can be verbal abuse, there can be sexual, uh, sexual abuse, there can be written and printed abuse, including online, which is massive, and we've seen certain increases, particularly under COVID. There can be indirect attacks on individuals and communities. There can be harassment, exclusion, or isolation. This by no means is an exhaustive list. There's many things that can happen to victims. Why we're particularly interested in working with businesses is because businesses are at the heart of our communities. They, they play a very, very important role. Not only do they generate profit and income, but they, they, they employ lots of people, they provide expertise and skills, they bring diverse people together. Tackling prejudice and discrimination is one of these things that as much as you try to avoid it, it's always there. It's always going to be there in society. And we've seen it recently with the Black Lives Matters protest in the United States in this country uh, about racial profiling recently with, the, with the, the Black athlete in London, J.K. Rowling's comments about transgender women, um, the care and support that is provided to our disabled people in the community and, and, and kind of in residential homes. So, Businesses, as I said, have a vital role. For any business, their biggest asset, in my personal opinion, or asset or resource, are their staff, their employees. I've spoken to many members in the business community, and, and they all say the same thing. If you have a, a, a really good member of staff, they're like gold dust. They're really valuable, and you want to hold on to them. But at the same time, it's very important to understand that there could be things happening in their life which can affect their performance at work, which can also affect whether they carry on working within that industry. I know and I've met victims of hate crime who've left their dream jobs because they're suffering and they're often suffering in silence and the employers don't know. We've met victims who, who are on their way to work are being abused. So they've decided to take a detour, which has added another hour, hour and a half onto their journey. And as a consequence, they're, they're repeatedly late. And it's got nothing to do with work, but it's what they're suffering, that abuse. And hate crime is very similar to domestic abuse. If you saw one of your colleagues coming into work with a black eye and you ask them what happened, the first time they may say, well, actually, I just walked into a door. You may believe them, but if you see it repeatedly happening and you see it's having an effect on their health and their well-being and their performance at work, I think any, any reasonable human being would, would, would want to help that person. And it's similar with hate crime. When you're seeing many of your staff members, particularly those in front line facing roles, such as retail, taxi drivers, those at door staff, nighttime economy, who are being abused repeatedly, it, it, it has a massive effect upon them and their, and their self-esteem and their ability to do their job. The second thing I think that's particularly important for businesses are customers. Our customer base across the country and across the world is becoming more diverse and more knowledgeable. And customers are becoming more, um, more, uh, more choosing in the businesses they want to interact with. Um, so recently we have seen in the, in the run up to the, the elections in the, America, in the United States, where a number of high profile sponsors are beginning to pull away from platforms such as Twitter uh, and, and not providing that sponsorship because they've not been able to challenge or do anything about the hate speech which is going on on that platform. And it's very similar, I think, to the kind of the fur trade and tobacco trade years ago, that actually this change happening, it's very slow. So before we begin this session, there's a couple of things I just want you to keep in the back of your minds, uh, some questions. Do you know what a hate crime is? That's the first one. Do you know how your business would respond if an employee or a friend or a colleague or even a customer is a victim? Uh, uh, of a hate crime? Do you know how to report a hate crime? Do you know where to report a hate crime? And do you have the mechanisms within your organization, your business, 
to support an employee who may be suffering. Now, the questions or the answers to each of these questions are, are, are universal, in my opinion. They apply, they apply to every sector. It doesn't matter whether it's a business, uh, it is in the volunteer, uh, volunteer or community sector. This is these are universal answers which we'll go through. We want to make sure by the end of this session that businesses feel a lot more confident and supported about how one to actually know what a hate crime is, how to tackle it, how to support their colleagues. If they're having issues, where to go for support and learn best practice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we created a guide uh, for businesses, which has three parts. It is a guide that is broken down to provide advice and help and assistance to an employee who may be a victim of a hate crime. It provides advice and assistance to uh, employers, managers, supervisors who may be having to manage a hate crime incident in the workplace. And it also provides advice and help for uh, HR departments and larger organizations about what is a hate crime? What does the law say? What can you do? What can't you do? This is what we've produced jointly with Enterprise Cars. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Natasha Wright from Enterprise Cars to talk a little bit about how we've worked with them to develop the guide, how the, how the guide is useful to them and the kind of how hate crime can manifest itself in the workplace. Hi, so uh, I'm Natasha Wright and I've been on the diversity committee uh, for the last three to four years at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, as you probably all know, Enterprise Rent-A-Car is a massive global organisation and it's quite segmented. So there's a lot of um, head offices and then obviously there's branches and various offices all around the world. Um, when I came onto the diversity committee, um, it was quite apparent that enterprise has got a very diverse uh, workforce and they're very keen on trying to input value on that, uh, of making sure that we are raising rent at all times and doing the right things for all areas of business, whether it be disabilities, whether it be the BAME community, whether it be LGBTQ plus um and you know so we started off as um across campuses um but we've kind of actually segmented off where we're now covering our own campuses um it's been quite an evolving journey so as as you can probably tell that with in big organizations especially if there's not massive amounts of people um you will find that um, a lot of people can everyone hear me okay just pop your thumbs up yeah cool um, so sorry, can I talk a lot of people yeah yes sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Tash um if there is right. a bit of background noise some people I've done they've got their um mics on mute I know Jane iPhone DM they're sort of coming up as still not having the um it's not being muted. If, if you wouldn't mind just double checking, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Tash. No worries, Karen. So, yeah, so basically what was becoming apparent is that there, although we, are, we have a very diverse work, workforce, not a lot of people always want to talk about it. Uh, not a lot of people obviously want to have it spread out, you know, said. Not everyone wants to know everyone's business as such um, so the the key things that we started to think about was okay we can understand everyone's need for privacy and things like that but how how do we best support them how do we find the right ways to make sure that if a person's in another department they can reach out to someone like myself if they feel that they need to talk or if they're experiencing some difficult times um, so obviously as you probably know if if you're suffering hate crime or you know you're suffering some some obstacles because of your sexuality because of your disability because of your religion um it can make you feel very demotivated make you not want to go into to work you know to not want to get up um i've i've experiences i've had some previous experiences not necessarily actually around my sexuality but in my past because of my gender and I can tell you now that it doesn't make you want to get up and go into work on a on a day-to-day -day basis. It, it, it 
can make you feel very, very vulnerable. It can make you feel very, very negative. It can make you feel very, very depleted. And you, and you don't give your company the best. You don't have the best of yourself. And, you know, emotionally wise, it's, it's quite traumatic at times. So what we started to look at is, okay, how many people actually report hate crime? Um, and when I sat down with Karen, who came in to do uh, a day with us, she did a presentation on facts and figures of crime. And then we had another member from the Hampshire uh, Fire. Uh, her name was Katie Cornhill, come in and talk to us about the transgender journey. She classed herself as a, as a female with trans history. That's how, how she put it. And the way she put it was very positive. Um, and it got a lot of involvement from, from the departments. People wanted to come, people wanted to listen, people wanted to know. Um, and when we, when we took it from there, we, we were looking at the stats of how many people actually report it. And then it was our idea to create a joint guide for managers, employees and HR staff, as Ranjeev said, uh, where basically we lay out what hate crime is, what steps you can take even if it's anonymously to report a hate crime and where you can go so it, it gives a lot more information because personally when before this i was looking at it and i wouldn't know where to go necessarily to report a hate crime outside of work i knew that if i experienced it in work or i saw it in work i could go to my hr team or I could go to my managers and I knew that they would then take the necessary precautions. They would have meetings, disciplinary action, etc. So I knew there'd be something done about that at work. However, I didn't know what to do if I saw it outside of work. Um, so the guide kind of gives us more information on where you can go, like third party reporting centers outside of, of your offices uh, to report things. But at the same time, by creating this guide, it really helped me uh, take on board some knowledge of, of what you don't necessarily think is a hate crime, but it is, you know, even if it's just a, a small remark, you know, oh yeah, so-and-so says this, so-and-so is that, oh, well, that doesn't look good on so-and-so, you know, silly little things that are gonna have such an impact on that person if they knew those marks are being made when they shouldn't even be made about them. It, you know, all the judgments that, that quite often is made, and you know, unconscious bias, um, so the guide was meant to kind of help with that and raise awareness across the campuses, the branches. Uh, I tried to spread it out as much as we could. And we even got um, on our last diversity event day, we actually got little QR codes. So you scan it and it actually brings up the guide and you can look at it on your phone. And by doing it that way, we've spread so much more awareness that I think a lot of people have taken a lot of knowledge from it. And as, as I've been doing that, I've actually had members come to me and talk to me about some of their difficulties with some of the journeys they're going through um you know and it has included obstacles like how do you get around religion how do you to deal with that if you're say going through a journey and you know one of your parents isn't accepting of it um you know how do you deal with the remarks how do you deal with not em being emotionally affected you know how do you deal with the obstacles if you're feeling vulnerable, especially if someone's going through a transgender journey where they're changing their look, what kind of wardrobe they wear, what makeup they wear, how they look throughout the company, you know, they they're very conscious of that kind of thing, how they get to and from work when they're they're wearing that, their outfits, it's them being them but no one else knows that because they're going through their journey from the outside. And therefore a lot of negative remarks and negative criticism is made. A lot of judgments, a lot of, like you said, sometimes it can even lead to abuse and, and violence, you know, all because that person is truly being themselves, but from the outside, it doesn't fully match the process they're going through at that time. So by dealing with it, it's actually made me really knowledgeable on how to kind of, help people who come to me and say have you looked at the guide is there anything i could do you know i may not be going through that process myself but i can sit here i can listen i can support and i can direct you in the right places where i think you're going to get the most value out of it um, and that's included sending 
inviting people to workshops or telling them local places that are helpful so in old shop we've got places like the source you know where they can go and have one-to-one -one, uh support groups and things like that so by building that base you're you're raising awareness but you're also creating a much more supportive environment and therefore the employees really take that on board and they really appreciate that and and they feel so much better in themselves and it and it really does work to see one of the members who's been so conscious about the journey that they're about to go through and how the reaction's going to be and you know what they were going to do and all i've done is kind of be an open ear to them and say this is where i would think you know what do you think about this okay talk to me about the difficulties i can't give you the solution but i can chat to you about it to make you feel better about it um i've even had them sending me pictures about their wardrobe and things do you think this looks good do you think i can wear this to work and all of that has really kind of helped improve their confidence and allowed them to be them true selves at work and it it really really does make a difference uh, you know even just one person you get so much more value out of them So uh, yeah, um, that that's kind of my introduction and kind of a bit about you know the hate crime in in enterprise, a bit about kind of what steps we've done. I mean, we do so much diversity work on a a month to month basis, a year to year basis. There's there's events tailored for everything that we can try and try and make sure we raise awareness in it in every area possible. And it's one of those things. It's continuous, ongoing improvements. We always look at ways we can. Uh, try and raise more awareness try and get the campuses and the branches to cross match together because things like um you know the branches has a very different atmosphere to the head office so it's trying to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and is taking what they can from the experience and getting what they deserve out of it so back to you ranjeev and karen unless anyone's got questions I'm, I'm not seeing anybody's hands raised, but then again, they're no. all on blank screens. But if, they, if you do have a question, please put it through to the chat box. Um, oh, someone's got a question, Ranjit, uh, asking if I'm the only champion. Oh, uh, right, sorry. They would, okay. I think. Um, no, uh, we have oh, multiple people. So in one of our campuses, we used to have two to three members per strand. So we had disability, we had... Uh, LGBT, we had, um, like, I think they call it multi-generational, so trying to make sure people are getting the best out of their pensions and near the end of their work experience. Um, then we had disability, so there was a good, there's been a good 10, 15 members per campus and there's generally maybe one or two champions per branch, so there's quite a lot of champions. No worries. Brilliant. Thank you. If there's any more questions, please put them through the chat box. I mean, I think one thing that what Natasha said just now, and, and it's very clear to me working in this field, hate crime, the actual committing of the offence itself, it, 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 can be, it can be so subtle and it can be also very extreme. So, for example, for myself, I, I won't name the, the kind of the retailer, but I'm, I'm out one day in Winchester, uh, no, sorry, in Southampton, I apologise. I'm, I'm trying to get my lunch. And I'm in the queue and, and I've got to get back to work. And we've all had this issue before where we're, we're rushing against the clock. You've got to get your sandwich, you've got to get your pasta, you've got to get back back. I'm in the queue and the, 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 the lady up the, on, the, on the till has Down syndrome. And the person in front of me is a lady who's much older. And she said, I don't know why they have people like her on, 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 on the till. I accept the lady was slow but she did the job. And I just thought, oh my God, you know, this is just, this is just appalling. And what this lady would have to suffer, you know, she's doing her job, she's slow, but she's doing it right, she's doing it correct. But that's, that's how subtle it can be in society, it can't be for business. And particularly for the victims, there's, there's, there's two aspects to it. There's, there's the hate crime that can be suffered by them within working within the industry from fellow colleagues or workmates or, or staff that work but then also there's the hate crime that they feel when they're in those front lines facing roles from members of the public so it's very important to report regardless of how minuscule you may think it is because i think the more reporting there is the more 
the, the police and, 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 and support agencies and partner agencies to see the scale of the problem and can actually respond. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce uh, Rajiv, Sergeant Eric, sorry. Apologies for the interruption, it's Tash again. Um, I just saw a question pop up from Nicole Bridgman. Are you right if I answer that quickly? Yes, yeah, sure, by my Who's next member? Um, in terms of doing presentations for the other organisations, we tend to do a lot of days um, internally within the campuses. We have done the odd external event, um, but we haven't actually done too many of them as of yet. Sorry, thanks Ranjeev. That's okay, no problem. Um, just gonna check on my chat if there's... Okay. Um, I want to introduce Sergeant Eric Wan from Hampshire Constabulary to talk a little bit about the importance of hate crime reporting and the community intelligence it builds. Hello there. Um, hope you hear, hear me all right. I did saw a question popped up at the bottom there to say is hate crime generational? Uh, unfortunately, the age um, uh, category is not under the hate crime. Uh, so if that, whoever that asked that question, that's um, the response to that. The, um, obviously, when, when we talk about hate crime, um, it's, it's important that you report to police because there's a, there's a crime element involved. That means that, that um, it, it, you know, the police should investigate it. And, and hate crime is actually one of the quite probably a few handful of instant or a, a, you know, crime that we actually do still uh, in investigate every every single one of them. So, for example, like like a theft from motor vehicle, um, you know, sometimes you report it. We 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 will just take the report and we wouldn't actually investigate it. So, so you know, pe people don't realise that the when when you do report a hate crime. Um, the the police do take it very seriously. So the 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 the, the importance of the hate crime. Obviously, people want justice to be to to be brought uh, if it, if they are a victim of the hate crime. Uh, if it happened right in front of you, um, and there's some degree of dangers involved, uh, and and you need the police there and there, you you have to report it by nine nine nine. And explain the situation that either your 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 life or immediate safety is in fear, or your property, uh, or or that could be um, some a third party as well, someone else that you witness uh, that just about uh, subject to a hate crime and their 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 safety is in danger, um, and 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 they they the call controller will try and deploy it. Um, if it's something that you are not in an immediate subject of, um, of being in fear of your violence or, or, or your safety is not in danger, then you can always report it online, um, either through the Hampshire Constabulary website or the, there's a, a website called True Visions who also uh, take report of hate crime and, uh, they, and that will get filtered through to whatever police force there is to do. And, um, and, and in, in Hampshire, Hampshire and I have white, the, the hate crime report will get taken. Let's say, for example, if, if, it, if you report it online, it will get taken and then it will get triaged and, and it will get assigned to the local neighborhood team. One of the reasons why is that is, is because the, the neighborhood team can, can look at the geographical, is that a geographical issue? So, so I take, for example, like the um, uh, corona related hate crime that. Um, that affected a lot of Chinese national in the last uh, last probably six months or so. So that geographically have a lot of effect on um, on on the Chinese national in Southampton and in Portsmouth as well. But we see a lot less of those in um, in other other area of the county. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It probably just mean that. that people it did happen but but people hasn't hasn't reported yet and that's why we we have done a lot of things uh, myself and a lot of the um community cohesion, cohesion officers trying to encourage report uh so that we can understand a better picture of this as well and how how it affect the community and 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 it's important that once we know about it we um we we know how to how to investigate it as well. So we, uh, or the hate crime, we go through a, a hate crime seven point plan. 
and that involved like how we manage the the the, uh, the, the, the suspect, you know, how we how we investigate a crime, like CCTV, uh, identifying the suspect and bringing the person in interviews, um, having some sort of action plan in terms of how we deal with the um, the suspect, and then the other aspect of this seven point plan is how we deal with the victim. So again, um, uh, how how we capture the evidence from the victim is that. Does that mean through statements or is that mean through vulnerable person interview and, and the safeguarding of victim as well? Uh, so the, the big example has been used now that if, uh, if, if someone had to go to work uh, and they bump into that, they bump into that suspect quite a lot of times um, while on the way to work and it affected their personal life and had to take a detour um, to, to, um, to, 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 to be able to go to work. And that's not right. And, and there is something that we know about it. We can, we can look at having officers being there at the time uh, and, and trying to identify the persons and, and trying to either speak to the person or maybe even arrest the person who, um, uh, uh, who, who have committed the offense. And, and this, and the, and the safeguarding side of things, uh, we, we like to, whatever the, the, the person's um, hate crime is. So, so again, I take the Chinese um, hate crime that linked to coronavirus. Uh, we were able to refer them to, to the local Chinese association to provide a support. Um, we, we identify some of them with students from the, from the local university. So I was able to touch in base with the with the um, local uh, the, the universities, the, the international office, the welfare well-being team, and the security team be able to put a sort of wrap around service around the, the, the victim that we can hopefully build the confidence of that victim back and, and not being affected um, uh, too much by the, by, by, by the hate crimes and, and, and be able to have the confidence to go out and things that the, 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 the issue is not them, it's, um, it's for the, it's, it's, it's the suspect. And, uh, and then the last one is a, a, a witness strategy. So if, if there is a witness to a hate crime, uh, we, we will look at how to capture the evidence as well. And, and equally, you know, if, if it happened there and there, we, uh, you know, my encouragement is always that if, it, if, it, if you get your mobile phone out and start filming it, that help us a long way because a lot of the hate crime that happened in the public place um, either doesn't capture on CCTV and CCTV don't, don't normally have audios anyway so a lot of the things been said is one words against another but if you get your mobile phone out um, it, it that act as a deterrence that the person might very quickly stop and, and, and it captures what they said it captured their faces we can we, we, we had a, a, probably about three months ago we had a hate crime incident happen at down at Ocean Village, and and the only way that we could have captured, uh, we have we have caught the suspect, is because the victim have got the mobile phone out, start filming it, pass the um, footage to the police, and we were able to release out onto the media, uh, and it was quickly identified from from member public that who that person is, and we were able to deal with the matter. So, so being able to capture that is um, it helped us a long way. And, um, and, and each hate crime have to go through um, a risk assessment as well. So the risk assessment will, will assess the impact of the, the person, the, the community and the, the wider public as well. So the, the assessment is, done, is assessed by the sergeants. So what something will be low will be, let, let's say for example, on a, on a Friday and Saturday night, a, a drunk person uh, make a, make a Make a make a comment uh, towards another person that that is being racist. So so that that will cast us a no because um, the, we don't foresee there will be any 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 future hate crime uh, safe safeguarding issue to the victim. Uh, the the suspect and the victim doesn't know each other. And we don't believe that there will be uh, the, the, you know, the the victim has been targeted as such. It's only a one off it's a one off occasion. So that. That will cast us, a, cast us a low. So something, something a medium will be to let's say, for example, 
Um, the, the coronavirus incident, for example, uh, it affected loads of Chinese community uh, in Southampton and Portsmouth, and uh, done by several members or, or several, several people. And graffitis, criminal damage is, uh, has been caused. Uh, and so, so that had a real impact on um, not just one person, but, but a group of um, uh, a, a, a person of a particular race. And, and, and if we don't respond uh, appropriately, uh, by engaging with that community for distance and the Chinese community, then then we will lose confidence of the Chinese community. And and you know we talk about hate crime has always been under reporting. Then then we'll probably get even get less report because because um, the you know the police response is not there. So we're not giving the confidence of people to report it. And so what classes are high? So high will be something like. Um, like a, like a terrorist attack might be happening happen in London uh, involving a, a, a certain faith group and, 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 and then that leads to um, certain uh, religious premises in Southamptons or, or, or other part of the counties being targeted even though they, they weren't involved and people think but people think they're associated with it uh, and not just that you know that people always perceive that other religious premises like these like the Sikh community is being um, targeted because of that as well so so that involved that is a have a real impact across the board um, across multiple um, a, a group of, of the uh, within the community so so that will cast as a high again that the, the policing response to it will, will go up and, and we will have to um, Give confidence to the to the to the to the community group that um, we we're actively we you know we will actively investigate whoever that caused uh, those issues and and have have give a bit of reassurance not just to that community but the gender the, the, the whole public as well that saying that that and send out a message that what those people are doing is not is we're we're not tolerating it. And um, each hate crime get reviewed by by the district inspector as well, or or, or the or inspector or buff. So so when whenever a hate crime come to an end, so let's say for example an investigation come to an end where we haven't managed to identify a, a suspect, for example, then um, then then it will get reviewed by an inspector before it can file, so that the inspector can. Then, to ensure that the, the the standard of the investigation is up to um, is up up to that standard, and we 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 satisfy that the all the inquiry that can be done is exhausted as well. So that go and 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 sometimes that means that the the victim might not want to make a complaint; they just want to report it, which is fine. Uh, but we will still look into to to the incident as much as possible, making sure that it's not like, for example, like. It happened in the same location at the same time, uh, and and it's not one individual who who are out there actively targeting um, a certain members of the of the community, uh, and and you know even though that the, the person doesn't want to make a complaint, doesn't mean that we we the the the, the suspect out there is not um, is not actively causing harm to anyone else. So we we like to have that those those sort of intelligence as well. Um, but you know, and and there there is a there there is also a hate incident as well. So we we talk about hate crime uh, as explained before. There have to be a crime elements involved. So so like the assault, like the criminal damage, um, the public order, etc. So a hate hate incident is uh, is the hate, but without the crime elements. And and it, it is in law that. Uh, if, if you are subject to a hate incident um, in England and in Wales, then then you 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 should report, report it to the police. So so is is a fine line between what is a crime and an incident. But I, I use this as an example. So so again during the coronavirus, uh, we have a group of Chinese students on a bus, and and we had a we have a lady who who who, who just keeps shouting the words Corona. Uh, while those while those Chinese students getting off the bus, so what what this lady said is not it's not harass, alarm, and distress. It's not abusive. 
just shout, merely shouting the word called Corona. It's not, uh, can't, you can't say that it's a public order, but, but it, it, the, the, the student feel that it's, it's, it's a hate towards them because she hasn't said it to anyone. It's said it to, to, to them because they, they're Chinese national uh, or, or, or have the oriental appearances. So, so this, that incident is a, is a hate incident and, and hate incident will go through the same procedure as a hate crime which will get reviewed by the uh, risk assessed and reviewed by the sergeants and, and then they will get reviewed by the inspector make sure that everything that police can do uh, is being done as well. So the, the community in, intelligence part of side of things is um, it's very important. I'm not too sure how many of you know about the um, the CPI, which is Community um, uh, Together uh, Community Partners uh, Intelligence Form that you can submit to the police. Um, it's it's not like a reporting. If if it is a crime, um, you should report it either through 101 or nine or, or 999. But but if it's something of a of a of an intelligent nature, so so you heard it from someone that that this is happening, then you can submit that um, uh, intelligence form to the police and it get reviewed by our local intelligence team uh, and it will get disseminated to, to our local neighborhood team. And, and, and again, the local intelligence team will look at, is that a pattern, is that a pattern of trend that happening? So, so again, you know, I'm just using it for example, is that a particular date and a time and a location where, where certain incidents is happening uh, that the, the, the actual victim themselves just haven't reported to the police, but but it's been but but it's been witnessed by by a particular individual or or, or been told for a third party that this is happening. So so this is a form that um, that that can submit to the police and and we'll be able to know about the um, the issues. So that is me. Uh, I see quite a few questions flash up while I was talking. So. Um, I'm happy to answer those if uh, if you let me know what it is. Karen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first question is, what support is offered to the victim after a complaint is made and for their safety? Um, support wise, the um, depends what the, um, the, 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 the hate elements is. So, um, Race again. I, I'm using the, the Chinese example because it's very fresh in my memory. Uh, we we refer them to the the, the local Chinese associations. Um, if it's in relations to the um, uh, sexual orientations, we got we got our local uh, LGBT officers that we can can um, put in touch with. And um, again, this depends on the geographical. And what support that we um, we, we will have in that location, and 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 the, that's why I go to the neighbourhood team because the neighbourhood teams tends to know what support is around um, the the area, and we can signpost that, that person if they want to 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 the support. Uh, so I can't, I, you know, on top of my head, I I I, I can't say for 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 once what what there is, but. But it is have to be done on a, a case to case basis. Obviously, if you're a victim of a hate crime, um, you you are you are automatically a priority victim in in, a, in the eyes of the court. So, there, there, if you're a priority victim, you're entitled in a, in a in a court system to have a to have a um, <clears throat> to to have an enhanced service. So your the, the the amount of victim update you will get from police will will go up from five days to one day. You got you you get you get informed more regularly, and when you get to court, you get to offer special service as well. Like um, again, a scream uh, where you don't, or or you can do your or give your evidence via the video link, etc. That again, that will have to be assessed on a on a case to case basis. Thank you. Uh, the next question I can answer if that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what is, um, it says, in terms of charging perpetrators of hate crime, what has been the success rate? And by luck, I've got the uh, latest edition of the uh, Crime Prosecution um, update on hate crime for our Wessex area, which covers a whole area. Yes. So in terms of Hampshire, the conviction rate is 83.1%. Mm. That's really quite a high conviction rate. 
um, and in 73.2% of cases, a sentence uplift was added to reflect the hate crime element. So that means if they were going to be sentenced perhaps to a year in custody, then there'd be an, an additional amount added on for the hate crime element. Um, in terms of the cases, I've only got the data across the whole Wessex area, but 78% of cases, um, there was a race or religious element. 63.3% uh, there was a homophobic or transgender element and disability. <coughs> I, that down. I think that was about 30 odd percent. Um, if people are interested, the um, CPS have got a scrutiny panel which looks at hate crisis incidents and they've produced a report. And I, I'll look and see if I can find an online reference to that so you can subscribe and then get all the data as we move forwards. Um, the next question was, have there been specific crimes in particular areas of the UK? Sorry, say that again. I don't quite understand that. Sorry. Um, sorry. Have there been specific crimes in particular areas of the UK? Uh, that's come from Nicole. I don't know whether that's kind of uh, relating to if there's like communities or something. Nicole, did you want to expand on that a bit? <coughs> Nicole? Yeah, sorry, comes. sorry, I couldn't find my mute button then. Yeah, so it, that's right, Karen. It, so if it's um, so for example, do you see different hate crimes up in like Birmingham area as you would do down in London area, and it, or if there's sort of like a particular hate crime that just happens in one particular area? So it's just a generalisation of like, do you see different things happening in different areas of, across the UK? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what I will be able to speak in, in the in the whole of UK, for example, but but um, certainly in Hampshire's and Isle of Wight, um, the, the the hate crime. Um, again, I, I'm only saying this because uh, I, there is under a, a lot of underreporting, but but a lot of the hate crime do just happen in in Southampton, um, in big city. So Southampton, Portsmouth, and yeah. and Pembroke, so and, and Isle of Wight as well. So. So, could I just come in there, Eric, if, if that's okay? Yeah, just, just to answer the question. Yeah, I think Eric's right. Wherever you see a congregation of people, not only will you see hate crime, but you will see crime. That, that's just universal. But it also depends on the environment. So, for example, we would see if there was a cluster of, say, LGBT bars in a particular area, then we can... I would say confidently expect there to be a level of hate crime there, public order. Similarly, we can see it around religious buildings. Um, we see it in, um, it, it can be in urban areas, suburban, even, even in rural areas where we, we're beginning now to see some evidence of rural hate crime, particularly against Eastern Europeans or particularly if people are moving into a new area. So um, I think this evening there's a piece going on on BBC South today about the experiences of a black family that moved from metropolitan diverse London to Dorset and their experiences of obviously moving from a diverse community to a predominantly white community. So I think it's not an easy answer to give and to say specifically where it happens, but what, what evidence shows us, it can happen anywhere at any time. And um, you, it, you, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a crime, unfortunately, and crimes we can't always predict. So I would always say, well, there's a congregation, a mass of people, you can expect things to happen. Thank you. The next question from Kirsten is, where can we get the form from? Um, I presume that means the reporting form, Kirsten? Yeah, the CPI form. It was actually from me, yeah. It's where oh, can we sorry. Get the, that's all right. Where can we get you the... You with the same name. Yeah, I know. Where can we get the <laughs> intelligent form that you, you talked about to, to report? Uh, the, I, I believe there's there's several. Um, it's online. I don't know. Is that one linked to the C, uh, OPCC office or not? But but um, maybe one that will uh, can help me out on this one. I know there's one on the um, there's a Hampshire police run website called Safe for Me, which is which is more targeted to the um, school age um, audience. So and there's one on there online. Um, Carla and Will, I don't know. Do you want to? Um, um, mention CPI form, where can it be found? Yeah, I can uh, add to that. There's a couple of different websites where you can find it. Um, it's quite a generic form. Um, so Portsmouth City Council will have a link to it, which is through 
Safer Portsmouth Partnership website. Um, I'm sure Southampton will have something similar. Like Eric said, I don't know if the OPCC has a link to it, but that could potentially be useful as well. To be honest, my recommendation would be if you type in community partnership information form and the city that you're in, you'll probably get the most accurate result or at least something that you can try to use. Hmm. I, just, okay, I just want to emphasize the, the, yeah. there, there is a difference between information and intelligence. So, so information is something that obviously a, a factual basis. So if you, if you or, or, or you've been told where something did happen, you should report it uh, on a generic way. But if it's intelligent, so you kind of heard it as a, as a hearsay um, matter about what happened, then, then that, is a, that is an intelligence that, that you, you submit through the intelligence form. Thank you. And I'll try and find a link so I can put that in the uh, chat in a minute. Uh, the next question is, if we observe a hate incident between a member of staff and a member of the public, apart from reporting it, would uh, we as managers challenge that person? Yes, the, it's, um, if, if you're talking about a, a staff member towards a member of public, then, um, then, then yeah, I mean, it have to, have to be challenged, really. I mean, it's, it's not just for diff discipline purposes, but educational as well, isn't it? So the, what, what will be difficult if it happened between staff members and staff members? Um, uh, what, what the hate crime elements sometimes do require is that it happen in a public place so uh, I, I use a classic example that I see all the time so uh, it's not work related but but if we if, if we have a multi-occupancy dwelling so a house that uh, have a have loads of broken down flat and and a person in one of the flats screaming their heads off shouting all sorts of racial abuse and they can be heard by an art person in a in a in a dwell in an art dwelling. Um, that that is not a hate crime, unfortunately. Um, so so again, if it if it if, if it happened to members of staff, um, and and it's not in a in a public place, that I I, I think that will have to be dealt with through through the employees' um, uh, channels. You know, the, the employers are. Uh, are obliged to you know co comply with the 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 e equality act and and bullying and harassment uh, that sort of thing so so yeah that uh, yeah again you know that I judge it on a base to base basis or you can always call one o one to get some advice but um but yeah that that will have to have to work like that All right. Could I add, could, sorry, sorry about that, Eric. Could, could I just quickly add? I think also, I think some a tool that I've always found very useful, uh, and, and one that you can certainly use within the workplace, or the business environment, is to kind of role reversal of the victim and, uh, uh, and the um, perpetrator, or to put yourself in the victim's shoes to say, well, actually, if that if I was listening to that abuse, or, or was being attacked, or was something we said against that, how would I feel? If you feel uncomfortable with it. Then yes, you've got to challenge it. I think that's that's the thing, and it also goes down. To, as I was saying at the beginning, the ethos of your company and your 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 kind of ethics and morals. Because eventually, if things are not challenged inter internally, they they spill out externally, and the impact is is, is it can be humongous. Um, we've recently seen with uh, um, Boohoo, the fashion design company, where they they have been uh, dropped by a number of businesses and organisations because of their working practices regarding cheap employment and no protection under COVID for a factory in Leicestershire. Um, and they've they've already come to, the, the, to seek to protect their own brand and their name. So again, you've got to you've got to sometimes step back a little bit and put yourself into the shoes of the victim to see well actually, is that right? And nine out of ten times, I think you would probably know. But as Eric says, you should have those internal practices built in. If you don't, the guides that we have produced can help with that information and kind of support you to actually say, well, what is what do we need to do step by step? Andy, thank you for that. I just wanted to say thanks to Eric as well. I think from my point of view, um, we work in a general open public space. Um, and at the start of COVID, one of my Chinese colleagues was being, um, a, you know, attacked by an elderly lady who had real issues with them being Chinese and working. 
Um, yeah. And fortunately, it wasn't reported to us until the customer had left. Yeah. But, you know, we, the team didn't know how to deal with it. They were just so shocked by her nasty comments. Um, and it's, it was almost too late to sort of do anything about it. And it's just how do we um, approach people in public if they're, you know, being like that? And, and what yeah. do we need? What do we need to say? And, and how do we deal with it? I think the using the video um, and your phone is, is brilliant. Um, although you don't want to make the problem even worse. Um, so it's just some guidance on that, really. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I, I will always encourage um, to speak up as well because, you, you know, whoever that is targeted to um, shouldn't subject to it. So, so if, if, if it's safe to do so, then speak up and challenge that person as well. Obviously, don't do it in a, a, that there is going to put yourself in danger and, and, and activate um, uh, more, uh, you know, more, more danger to yourself. But um, but uh, it's interesting you mentioned that one because um, I, I don't know is it related or not. But one one of the examples in Southampton is that there was a lady who do exactly the same um, in 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 a lot of the big shop in in Southampton. Uh, and the only way that we knew is the same lady is because it got reported and we were able to follow up with with, with CCTV and and, um, and 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 some of the other inquiry from the victim. So. So that, and although she's an elderly lady, she still get dealt with the same, uh, you know, she's still got interview in custody and all that. So um, yeah, it's going, it's going through court at the moment, that case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just got a request for you to repeat the name of the TV programme on later tonight about the family who moved from Dorset to London. Oh, it's not. It's not a. It's not a TV program. Sorry, it's. It's. I. Uh, uh, it, it should be on South today this evening. I've. I've. I've was, I was told by a colleague. So um, I'm hoping it's on there. If not, um, I'll find out further details. But it should be a news item on South today. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and then I'm just going to hand over to Tori for a few minutes. Um, just to kind of. Um, Tori just wanted to explain to people a bit about the support available through the Victim Care Service. Yes. Hi there. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, I'm just going to get my notes up. Bear with me. Um, yeah, it's a really good opportunity to to share with with so many of you in the meeting. So, um, so just I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. Um, for those that don't know, the Victim Care Service we are commissioned by um, the Hampshire Police and Crime Commissioner, um, but we're provided uh, by that, that's delivered by Victim Support, which is the national charity. Um, we cover all of Hampshire and Isle of Wight and we cover all crime types as well, but I'll obviously talk specifically about hate crime here. Um, since January, just because that was a, a nice figure to start with, uh, yeah, we have supported 186 uh, cases um, of hate crime um, throughout Hampshire. We, um, we do broach the subject of hate crime as well as domestic abuse and sexual abuse with every single one of our calls. Um, and just to give you an idea of what cases we receive, we get an automatic data transfer from Hampshire Police overnight. So um, with the majority of cases, that's an opt out system. So we get quite a large proportion of those cases. With hate crime, because it's quite sensitive, there is an agreement at the moment where it's explicit consent. So as long as the officer has asked, um, uh, that should be um, ticked on the system and that should uh, come over to us the next day. Um, because, as we were saying, it is enhanced that they are entitled to enhanced support hate crime um, victims, we um, will call them uh, twice within 24 hours in order to, to see if they would like support. Um, we have a range of support options available as well. Um, we have something called Beyond Crime Tools, which is a, a wealth of resources that we can send out. We have something called My Support Space, which is an online space to help manage impacts of crime. We've also got access to send out um, Silver Cloud, which is a, a CBT based online programs. Um, we've got 24 hour availability as well uh, via our support line. Uh, we've also got a live chat, which is the same. So that if people don't want to pick up the phone and phone us, our phone number is free as well. But if they don't want to phone us, they can um, you know, do it online and speak to somebody that's trained. Um, and also we, 
because they're a part of the enhanced entitlements, we have a priority team. Our priority team um, uh, ha go through a course of training, which is three days, um, so that we are um, aware of the impact that people might have um, in the various degrees of hate crime. And also, as it's been mentioned before, we are very much aware too that there are crimes and incidents as well. And um, it's, you know, we support all of those that they still do come through to us. Um, we are a third party reporting centre too. So um, that will always be offered if they're referred to us. Um, we have uh, a website too, uh, which is Hampshire IOW for Isle of Wight Victim Care. On there is a service directory. I'd really um, encourage people to have a look because you can actually find, you can go to a find help tab and on there you can actually filter hate crime and it should come up with everything that's available in areas and you can specify your area too. So you can say Portsmouth or Isle of Wight or all of Hampshire and it should come up with, with all organisations available. Um, always though, I'm happy to share my email. Please, if you go on there and you notice anything that's not included or anything needs updating, please do let me know because I, I just need to change it or add something. So it's just kind of sharing, sharing that around everywhere. Um, so yeah, I think that's about everything that I've tried to cover in a <laughs> whistle-stop tour. But the last thing on there is um, we do support witnesses as well and anyone that's been impacted by crime. So it might be in a business setting, someone's targeted someone else, but it might be a witness that's really impacted about what, what that is about uh, or what, what's been said or done. And we can support those people as well. So um, it can be direct or indirect victims. Um, so yes, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to pop them down below. But I hope that's given um, a quick overview of, of what we do. And thank you for letting me uh, nip in there. <laughs> thanks, Tori. Um, um, thanks to Eric as well. I think it, it, it kind of shows that the importance of reporting and why we need to report. Um, a couple of days ago, I thought, it's one of these things that, you're an insomniac, you can't get to sleep, so you watch all this stuff on TV. And I think it's about two o'clock on Monday evening, I was watching uh, a program about um, a history of African nurses, also um, Afro-Caribbean nurses who'd been asked to come to this country to help support the NHS from the 50s onwards. And um, it, it, there, was, there, was a, there was a very happy element to it as well, but there's unfortunately a very sad element to it as well. The kind of racial abuse they suffered uh, not only from uh, the patients that they, they were there to help and support, but also from their colleagues within the organisation, uh, being the health service. So a number of good, well-trained, well-educated nurses left, and ultimately it's we, the public, who lose out uh, on, that, on those skills. Um, I'd just like to move on to um, my colleagues Ahmed Sasso and Will Bergstrom, who are both community cohesion officers who uh, respectively cover the two unitary cities of Southampton and Portsmouth. And I'd ask a little bit of input about the community perspective of what kind of businesses could do and, and how they've engaged with businesses within their, within their cities to kind of tackle hate crime. Go on, Unreal, you start. <laughs> All right. Delegate, um, I like <laughs> Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. So just to give a bit of a context for our role, so as Ranjeev mentioned, we're community cohesion officers for Hampshire Police. So basically the areas that we look at are kind of engaging with communities, but also tensions within and between communities. So obviously hate crime plays a big role in that. Um, I'm sure some of you will have seen reports that hate crimes have increased both nationally and obviously locally as well in the last couple of years. We tend to see that as a positive thing, and I know that sounds really strange, but the reason is because we know that hate crime is so underreported. So actually any increase in hate crime is more likely to be a result of people being more confident to report to us. That being said, obviously hate crime is still very much underreported. So I think at the end of the day, that's the reason that we do a lot of these sessions, just to make sure that we know it's out there and at the moment people aren't getting the support that they need so we need to make sure that that support is available and people know who to turn to when they need that support so in terms of our roles um 
the three of us are here. So Kyla Hare Foster is a community cohesion officer as well. She's waving in the background. Um, so we cover different areas. So I work specifically in Portsmouth, but obviously we do work Penn Hampshire as well. So just to give a very brief, and I'm conscious of time, a brief update on what we do in Portsmouth specifically. So we have a third party reporting center network, and I won't go into too much detail because I think the next session or the next topic will be TPRCs. So just to give a very basic explanation, um, because of the underreporting of hate crime that I mentioned, we know that a lot of victims don't want to come to the police directly. So what we've established with the OPCC and something that we're trying to encourage is third party reporting centers. So these are basically organizations that provide that alternative way to report a hate crime if people don't want to go directly to the police. So in Portsmouth, we're still in the kind of early stages of developing this network. So at the moment, we have eight TPRCs. These include kind of partners within city council. It includes university and also kind of community facing groups. One thing that we would like to expand more into is businesses. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of it is that nationally, academic research shows that you know, places like schools, universities, um, pubs, bars, nightclubs, um, city center, so that generally means kind of shops and supermarkets. Most of those are about 10% of hate crimes. So if you put all of that together, you know, it seems like businesses or business related locations account for about 40 to 50% of all the hate crime that is reported. So that's quite a big number. Um, in terms of our repeat victims, we also know that our top repeat victims are within kind of the business setting. So that tends to be kind of bouncers at nightclubs and within the nighttime economy, but also kind of um, security in shops and supermarkets. So I think as Ranjeev kind of touched on and mentioned in the beginning, for a business perspective, there's kind of two sides to hate crime. One of it is against employers, and that would be kind of the repeat victims that I mentioned, but also as part of customers. And we know that when a person is a victim of hate crime, 61% of victims are likely to avoid that place in the future. So obviously there is a big element and the primary element is kind of the duty and responsibility to protect both employees and customers from any abuse but there's also an indirect impact obviously on business and customers coming to a business if they have been a victim of hate crime. So two of the things that we're kind of looking at and just very briefly is like I said, trying to encourage reporting of hate crime. Um, so this can be done through third party reporting centers or other means, getting businesses to support these schemes to make sure that, first of all, we get the numbers, we get a whole picture so that we can work with businesses to then address the issues. Um, and the other side that we're looking at, for example, in Portsmouth is exploring ways of working with businesses to establish kind of safe spaces or addressing some of these barriers that we know victims face to reporting. So that's a very brief kind of overview, but I think, the main thing that we're trying to focus on is getting a better understanding of what the problem as actually is so that we can take a more evidence-based approach to addressing this and working with businesses and kind of the main stakeholders and partners in this to make sure that we're maximizing the opportunities of collaboration because at the end of the day, we're all in this together and kind of all of us are affected by it. So it doesn't make sense to work on it in silo. So that's very briefly from me. I don't know if Ahmed wants to add a bit more from a Southampton perspective. Yeah, thanks very much, Will. Um, I'll try not to sort of uh, go over the things uh, others have already mentioned. Um, what I would like to talk about very briefly, and I, again, I will try not to cross, uh, come across to the stuff that Sam will be talking about after us, but um, I wanna talk uh, very briefly the overview of the Southampton uh, third party reported network that we have 
and how it, be, it came to be and where we are before, then I pass on to Sam to, to, to carry on from there. But briefly, initially, what I want to say is, from what has just been said, there are two things that are important to me as uh, the Southampton Cohesion and Engagement Officer. Part of my role, as, as uh, Will have said, uh, is to work with community across all backgrounds, cultures and faith to develop that um, trust and confidence that we need to keep everybody safe. Um, the Southampton Third Party Reporting Network was developed as a result of, if you all remember, we had the 2016 Brexit um, uh, outcome. After that uh, uh, election, for some uh, um, reason, uh, many people sadly in, in, across all communities felt that uh, uh, because of the decision of that election, they, can, they became emboldened to basically uh, pick on mainly European migrants, but also included a lot of our minority communities. And the incidence of hate crime was happening over and above uh, what would normally be, but in most cases, as already mentioned, they weren't being reported. So um, to counter that and, uh, and reassure the community, um, at the time, the Connect group, you may or may not be aware who they are, but they are the, the main strategic group that runs our city in Southampton, in which includes the council, the police, the universities, the health service, and so forth, um, basically came out with what, we, what is referred to as the hate crime pledge, to basically say to all communities, um, Southampton is a very diverse city, it welcomes all people from all backgrounds and cultures and will not accept any kind of hate crime whatsoever. However, what we didn't do as, as the statutory bodies after that pledge, in my view, was to give the community something to use to actually utilize to report these hate crime and, and also seek support for the victims. Uh, there was nothing like that that they could to, go to as such that they knew of. So, the beginning of 2017, uh, the city council and the local police together actually then established what is now known as the Southampton Community Third Party Reporting Network. Initially, we had about half a dozen key community partners on board. They covered all the, the, the five areas that Ranjiv mentioned that we, the police, report to the Home Office on in relation to hate crime. And, and it was to do with basically those are communities that members of the public feel safe to go to, to talk about issues that impacts on them and their families. Um, and initially it was not just to do with hate crime, but anything. So we said to these partners, can you add hate crime as another service you provide so that we can then encourage people to consider in reporting these incidents as they happen but also to provide that support they need and, and give them options of how they can report these. Um, in two years, between 17 and 19, that network has grown hugely. We now have 32 different communities on board, but we also have parallel running with it, a network of agencies. And I think at the last count, and I might be wrong and Sam might correct me because he's got more knowledge as he works with it every day, there's about six to eight statutory agencies on board running parallel with the community. And one of the bonuses of that we've found is not only do they deal with hate crime, talk about it when they meet and provide support for each other from their own expertise and knowledge as a group, but they also now exchanging a lot of other information between themselves. So they are, they are actually building cohesion within the city and strengthening it. Strengthening it. In 2019, it was last year, Sam, wasn't it? Um, your, your role started? Uh, yes, it was. Yes. In 2019, yes. with, with funding from both the OPCC and the City Council, we were able, the network were able to actually recruit a part-time coordinator, which is Sam. And I'll leave Sam to tell you all about what he does, and he does a lot of things and, and where we're going with it. Um, but the important thing for me is, while we're developing this community network for third party reporting, we are still very, very much behind in bringing on board our business partners. And that's an area we are, I know we are working on. I know Sam has already started doing a lot of work uh, uh, in, in relation to our business partners. And that for me, that community, the business community is very important to be part of this because they play a major role in people's lives. 
Ranjiv mentioned earlier that one of the biggest assets of a business is its people, which is true. Now, if you have, if your people are suffering in whatever it is, and if hate crime can be very impactive, not only on the individual, but their family, and in some cases across a whole community, if they are suffering and they don't feel that the employer is actually giving them that support, you're going to have uh, employ uh, employees who aren't going to be able to deliver or be efficient in what they do, uh, if not leave. So what the network would provide for businesses, if, um, if we were able to bring them on board to be part of this scheme in the city, is that you will have a support mechanism uh, already up and running that you could say to your people in the, in the business, if you don't want to come and talk to us, or if you don't have faith to talk to us, as sometimes some people don't, I know in the police, I have colleagues who would rather go talk to an outside uh, person about their issues to help them than actually talk internally for all sorts of reasons. So in that case, they can come and seek that support from the network. And as I said, we have members who will cover all sorts of areas of some of people's lives in relation to hate crime. It, it has grown faster than we, we thought it would. And that's the reason we brought on board uh, uh, Sam to basically take on a lot of the management and the running of this, this area of the city's uh, support mechanism. And obviously also to encourage people to keep on reporting these incidents because it is very important for us, the police and this council to be aware of what's happening where so that we can actually put whatever relevant resources in place to support and deal with those situations. So very quickly, and I know I'm uh, conscious of the time, businesses in Southampton are an area that we very much need to be on board with us with the third party reporting. And if you need any more information uh, over and above what is, you've heard today and what Sam will be talking to you about, um, I'm sure he will also give you the contact details for him to, to get in touch, whether it's training, whether it's actually support, um, it's all there. Use it, come on board and be part of what is really going to build up not just the city cohesion, but your business at the end of the day. Thank you, Ranjeev. You're on commute, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Ahmed. Um, yeah, nicely passing on seamlessly on to um, Sam Waddington, who is the, co um, the coordinator of the third party reporting network in Southampton. Um, Sam, could you just talk a little bit about the network, its membership, and also the work you're doing around businesses? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Ranji. Yeah, thanks for um, inviting me um, today to talk about the uh, Southampton Hate Crime Network and work that we're doing. Um, so, yeah, as um, Ahmed was saying, um, we've been set up since about 2017 um, now, just the Southampton Hate Crime Network. And um, as Ahmed said, we, we're a system of third party hate crime reporting centers um, and that to help anybody that not only faces hate crime, but, you know, witnesses it or is, is affected by it. Um, to just come forward and um, you know tell us about really what's happened and so we can um, ensure that they're directed to the right um, places um, so we're, we're a system of all sorts of different organizations as Ahmed mentioned that's involved statutory organizations and many different um, community organizations whether that be charities or advice centers for um, the types of people that are affected by hate crime. So, you know, advice centers for um, religious people or disabled people that deal with issues or, or anyone else who might be a, a victim of, um, of hate crime. And they can contact these places. Um, there's, yeah, over 30 of them across the, the, in Southampton. Um, and then, then they can, then basically the, the, the reporting center can help them in a number of, a number of ways um, it can be sometimes just listening to the individual and what they have to say because um, it's likely that with the organizations we have involved in the network um, they work with the types of people affected by hate crime on a daily basis so um, they're going to have that knowledge and experience and expertise um, you know to, to, to understand what the individual has has gone through um, and sometimes that's all people want is, you know, they just want somebody 
people understanding who can listen to them and uh, and and someone who can talk to them about about what they've experienced and that can make people feel more comfortable the other times it's a bit more in depth support that people need um so we can give you more um yeah support in terms of so you know the right places to go to get more specialist support because really we're more of a, a signposting mechanism um but um but if you tell us then we can we can help you um so that involves um as sort of some of the tools online tools have already been mentioned um you've got yeah the victim support service and then you've got um yeah the true vision um site um so we can direct people to them and then other places that are um yeah that are more or more generic in terms of dealing with dealing with hate crime um and because the main issue with what we've got with the reporting set um, with reporting hate crime and that's the same for for everywhere really is a lot of people are uncomfortable about going to um you know statutory agencies like the police um so they can feel um it's just what people feel sometimes that they think they might not um you know be 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 their case might not instant might not be dealt with as seriously as it could be or they might be worried that they're going to lose their anonymity and their name's going to be released to the public which is um, not, not what people don't want um so if they've got somewhere separate from these statutory organizations um they've got these these reporting centers they can go to uh, about hate crime and then they hopefully going to feel more comfortable about coming forward and then we'll actually know about the incident and be able to support the individual and it's also about making sure we record that um so if they come forward we can then record the, the incident that's happened um and that's that's just useful for us as a network um, and we will always the reporting centers always keep anonymity um they, you know, they're not going to keep the individual's name just the, they'll keep keep details about the incident so that if it, if it needs to take it further forward to the police if it is serious and it, and it has to be taken to the police then it then it will be and um and, and it's also useful to know what type of instance we're dealing with so that we can um improve our, our work and, and know that the areas that we need to perhaps have more focus on and things like that um so yeah we've got the the support element then there's the uh recording element um and then there's also yeah um reporting we although we say we're about you know we we want to give people another avenue instead of going to the police and we want to try and keep people anonymous and, and things like that um you know if, if a situation is urgent enough and um needs urgent attention to and someone is in danger then um we have a responsibility as reporting centers to, to take that to the police um and that can sometimes be whether or not the individual wants that to happen or not um because obviously they're in danger they're in danger and that needs to be uh, acknowledged um so but um you know that that's not the only option we'll, 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 we'll decide first of all and what and what needs to be needs to be done and, and as it's been said in, in this session today you know it's always a case-by-case -case basis so although we give lots of advice to our reporting centers and i'm because um, i'm a coordinator for the network i um you know manage that support that's given to the reporting centers um you know that we'll have i've created guides and things for for these reporting centers to use so that they can more effectively help people when they come forward but um you know it's also you know need um groups to sort of you know deal with it as you know case by case because it's um hard to give advice for every situation so um you know as much as we we try and give people direct advice it's um you know we're just hopefully making people feel more confident to to take the right um decisions when someone comes forward um but yeah i've said that obviously that's to do with third party reporting but our network um we, we're doing more work yeah but our, there's wider work that we do in terms of on, on tackling so for example the work that we're doing at the moment uh is with young people well we're, we're, we're planning the work that we're going to be doing with young people and that want to sort of um communicate with schools more to, to educate um, them about hate crimes not enough 
the young people know actually what paid crime is um, and therefore that that's not only going to mean um, they don't report it if it happens to them but it's going to mean that if they um, yeah don't know what hate crime is then they might easily you know um, commit commit a hate crime and not really understand the seriousness of, of, of a hate crime in the first place so it's, that's a really important thing that we, we feel we need to do um, obviously it's been a bit more difficult at the moment given schools have been closed and whatnot so we hope that from next term uh, that work can really kick off and, and we can um, get, yeah, yeah, really start to, to, to work with young people and, and, and then we want to do that in engaging ways you know sometimes you can just give presentations but we want to make it a bit more informal and more um yeah essentially more fun for, for individuals i think if if the young people are going to be doing something that's 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 fun and and, and um and engaging they're likely to remember it and, and and that will be useful obviously to them in the future um so that's that's part of the one part of the work we're doing and then there's another part as ahmed was was pointing out um we do really need to work more with businesses and that's something i'm trying to to get started um yeah because we feel with their resources and what they have access to and and, and the amount of, you know that the amount of hate crime that they do see and experience that they're going to be really um useful to inform our work and make us better at, at tackling hate crime um, across the city so working with the um the go southampton uh, business improvement district um, which has uh, network, uh, yeah, has links to all, all sorts of different retail organisations across um, Southampton, and we're developing a training pack that can be used for the Southampton businesses. Um, that uh, so they can do workshops with their staff, um, similar to the ones for young people, but these will be more geared towards um, retail organizations. Um, so that would be, you know, things like doing role play scenarios so that if, if what happens, um, you know, if situations were to come up, they'd know what to do because um, they've kind of um, practiced them and things like that. Um, so yeah, so we can, they're trying to use the Go Southampton link to, to get to those businesses um, so they can, um, yeah, and make hate crime a part of the um, any training that they they do. Um, but also, we want to use that as a starting point to then get more businesses sort of involved in the network directly and, and using their resources and, and things like that. Um, so, I think this this could be a good opportunity. Um, I know there's lots of people here, and obviously, lots of you will have networks with other. Um, this, probably with businesses and other organisations. Um, so what I'm going to do in a second is I'll put my um, details on the chat box. Um, but I'd encourage everyone to, you know, if, if you're interested in in a sort of getting involved in the network, perhaps becoming a reporting centre, or um, you know, it, it, yeah, engaging yourself as a, as a business or whatever, um, then yeah, please do contact me and I can um, yeah talk to you more about the network and we can work on we can look at ways that you can get involved. Um, so always um, conscious that all the organizations involved in our network are voluntary. So they do it as an addition to the work that they do in their, in their day jobs. Um, so yeah, certain, certain organizations, especially the smaller ones will only be able to give certain time and, and resources to the network. So, um, yeah, anyone that wants to get involved, it, you know, it can be as little or as large. It's it's important just to have lots of members involved because, um, yeah, the, the idea of the network is to build community co cohesion and have the community um, driving the, the, the tackling of hate crime rather than um, just statutory agencies. Obviously, we'll work with statutory agencies as, as they'll have certain information that we that we need and and will be helpful, but. Um, yeah, if it's the community at the, the heart of it, um, then that can only, um, yeah, that, that can only be, be be a good thing. And, and you know, people that the outside the public, we obviously we want to increase our awareness. But um, if the public see that that all community is working together to tackle hate crime, then they're going to be more encouraged to to get in, to get involved, and then that's going to have a, an even a, a big impact. Um, so yeah, so although supporting victims is is needs to happen because 
um, unfortunately, as we've seen, um, we've been talking about, you know, that a lot of people that Vincent's go and reported, a lot of people who are who are suffering in silence, so to speak, and 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 they need to be able to. We need to make sure that they get do get the support that they um, they need because they were seen arises in in, in reporting incidents being reported. Uh, it's hard to establish whether that's just because of <coughs> we as a network um, are, are doing more work or because more um, incidents are actually happening. Uh, it's probably a bit of a bit of both, but yeah, we, we want people as many people as possible to to, to come forward. Um, so that's 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 really important for us. But um, there's also other work that we want to do, as, as I've mentioned, to to make sure that um, we're at, um, yeah we're we're trying to stop it stop incidents from happening in in in, in the first place. Um, so yeah, I mean that's um, probably all I needed to. to um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions, then um, they're welcome to answer it in the chat box or ask me now, or whatever. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm just very conscious of time because um, no, this no, is no. an hour and a half. So um, if there are questions, we could please feel free to email them to ourselves and we can get them answered. Um, um, I just want to wrap up a little bit quickly uh, towards the end of the session in terms of what support and resources are available out there for businesses to help uh, tackle and address any hate crime that they come across. We've already mentioned the, the hate crime booklets that we at the PCC's office have created, which is specifically aimed at the business community. These booklets are, are aimed for business. They've been created by business for business. So you have step-by-step -step guides, you have information points, you have further resources. Uh, you, you, you're, you're given opportunities if, if, if you need to comply, ask other questions or, or seek information it should be in there if there isn't anything in there by all means you're more than welcome to contact myself or colleagues from the PCC's office um, uh, I think Tori's gone but again the victim care service or victim support which provide the victim care service is a free service um, so you may be a small organization you may not have kind of counsellors or a kind of a well-being team or a big HR department to provide that support but that support is freely available from the victim care service who provide practical emotional and, and intensive support again that's a free service it doesn't matter when the crime happened or the incident happened it is irrespective of whether you've reported to the police or not so you can still access that resource similarly on our website the PCC's website um, you'll find a list of all the third party reporting centers across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, there are around 70 at the moment, and we want to obviously see that number increase, and particularly within the business community. Uh, there's also a, a, a shed load of materials and literature, which is freely available for yourselves as a businesses to download, to read, uh, posters to use information, uh, uh, booklets again, on, on uh, specifically not aimed at uh, the business community but university or anybody what is the hate crime what is the help and support available there um, we will uh, send out a, uh, a link to this um, recording uh, in a couple of days time uh, with all our contact details but also details of where you can find information on our website um, unless there are any really really crucial questions um, uh, um, this is an opportunity uh, for you for you to ask them uh, if not I, I will bring the session to a close Karen is there anything you want to add I think you know that's great thank you I think um, all the questions that we've had in the chat box have been answered um, but I say we will be here for a few minutes after the call if anybody did want to hang on a few minutes and yep. um, and ask us anything else just sort of conscious for some people obviously you do need to go on time so thank yep. you all very much for coming. Um, hope it's been useful. If there is anything additional that we can help you with or provide information, as Ranjit was saying, please, please don't hesitate to contact us. But thank you all very much for coming today. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And I, and I echo that. And, and a big thank you to all our speakers, to, to Natasha from Enterprise Cars, from Sergeant uh, Eric Wong from the Constabulary, to my colleagues, Ahmed Sasso, Will Bergstream, uh, Community Cohesion Officers, and Sam Waddington from Spectrum, a Centre for Independent Learning uh, coordinator of the Third Party Reporting Centre network in Southampton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.